So can I welcome you back to our final session of Rising 2021 and hugely important and a great testimony to our, our local uh, politicians that uh, Andy Street, who's the mayor for the West Midlands, has agreed to come and, and have conversation about the themes that we've been discussing. Andy, I'm really pleased and delighted that you've, you've agreed. And I know you have a busy agenda. I know you've just come down from Glasgow um, and you're off somewhere else in a minute. But <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> in a minute or two, yeah. Um, but as we've been discussing uh, together for three days, we've been concerned that we live in a terribly difficult time uh, where we could log, as academics we often do, all the challenges that we face. And we're looking now, this, this year's rising, at the theme of leadership and how a more effective leadership can help navigate some of these changes. And is leadership up for this? Is it competent? Is it supported enough? So that's really the basic theme. But I wanted to start in, in our conversation, apart from welcoming you very warmly um, and congratulating you, of course, to, to being elected again as, as, as mayor of our region just to think about the way in which you've observed communities in the West Midlands in your time as mayor and the extent to which you would say that they're thriving and peaceful and can point at good examples. That'd be a great place to start, I think. Of course. Well, first of all, can I just say thank you to you, Mike, for giving me the opportunity to come and do this. I said some years ago I would definitely you come did. and take part yes. in a rising event <laughs> at the right moment. Yeah. So really pleased to be able to do it in such a lovely surrounding, of course, this afternoon. And um, it's an interesting time to reflect on the word leadership because, as you say, I've just literally come down on the train from Glasgow this morning yeah. and, my goodness, the COP debate is all about a challenge to leadership and it would be oh so easy for everyone to stand back and say, well, we're watching what President Xi, what Mr Putin, what President Biden are doing. But I've actually come back on that train with a completely different attitude, yeah. which I think will pervade the conversation we're going to have, right. which is actually leaders have got to say, what can they do in their area, almost whatever the subject is? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's an abdication to say we just look to our biggest international leaders mm -hmm. to actually solve everything. And we've got to try to take responsibility locally for as much as we can. And of course, everyone has their horizon limited by their responsibility in one sense. But I genuinely believe that everyone can play their part. Yeah. And to your question about what, how you might define thriving communities uh, across the West Midlands, uh, I mean, a number of things, but maybe just one or two to pull out. It's obvious point, but where there is real good choice of jobs, of economic opportunities, yeah. that does help but not on its own, and not, not a determinant, but it obviously is a huge ingredient, and I'm mm. sure we'll talk about that. Mm. But what I've been struck by, particularly through the pandemic, and I'm sure you've had lots of talk about this in the last two and a half days, the communities that are really strong are the ones where there are strong family institutions, maybe, strong civic institutions, but particularly faith organisations. Mm. And we've seen the faith organisations step forward and play such a critical role in the resilience of our communities. Mm. And often, as I look across the whole of the West Midlands, some of the strongest communities are actually the ones where there are many different faiths coming together. Mm. And if I think of this city, just pull out a few places, and whatever I say, I'll be booed by some, but I will just pick out one or two of the sort of ingredients that I see, some of the suburbs where I think I've seen different examples of strength. And of course in Earlston. Now I think of Earlston a bit like Moseley in Birmingham, maybe Tetnall in uh, Wolverhampton, yeah. relatively affluent places, but genuinely mixed places yes. where that mixing is a form of huge strength. Mm. I've seen the church in Kersley be a centre of a vibrant community and obviously for that is true, but it's just as true. If you go to the Gurdwara at Harnell Lane, for example, I've been there for a number of things. Mm. It was symbolically where we met for the interfaith uh, meal that the City of Culture put on, and you see the strength of that. But I've also seen an incredible strength in some of the toughest communities where the community centres are playing a role. And I have etched in my mind the sort of programme of activities that I've seen in Willenhall, for example. Yeah. So yeah. different institutions 
are providing strengths to different communities, actually. So your, your answer is a superb description of the conditions we, we talk about in, in the academy of positive peace. So we're not interested just in peaceful and thriving communities as a, as a, as a place where there's an absence of conflict, an absence of war. We are interested in identifying the conditions that are more likely to lead. So family, faith leaders, coming together in the way that you're describing is, is an excellent, and, and, and there are plenty of examples in your region, I think. Oh yes, plenty we of can examples. Point this to. city, we yes. hardly need to look beyond. No. Yeah. And we've had, uh, of course, we host Rising in the cathedral because it is itself an iconic place. Of course. And uh, with uh, tentacles and reach all across the world, you know, the most twin city in, in the world, Coventry, 24, I think, twins elsewhere, based upon the experience of this place. So it's, it, it is inspiring, and we've been inspired. And your notion about your new found confidence as a regional mayor, that you can make a change at your local level, I think resonates strongly with a message from Archbishop Welby yesterday. Justin was very clear in his discussions that we all have resources and constraints resources, but we must use them to the best, I think. So your favorite examples of thriving communities you shared with us, and they're not just the, the poorest places nor the richest places, because they share common characteristics. That's the point. You have definitions that come from different pieces. And of yeah. course, you know, I was at Finham for the village, I'd probably describe it wrongly, I'll call it village fair. Yeah. And you saw there so many voluntary organisations that mm. were all playing their roles. The fact that library was run by the community now and each stall represented an institution, really. Mm. And that was an incredible... It just struck me on that morning. That is an incredible well of confidence, of... Mm. Um, um, yeah, confidence is the right word, actually, mm. that is supporting other people in the community as well. So it was just played out in that day, but it definitely doesn't just characterise the most affluent places no. in the city. That's a very important point. So I want to tease out a few more things about what, what your experience has been of building these sorts of contexts. Of course, as, as, a, as a regional mayor, you can enable this. So what role is there for you as mayor, do you think, mm. in creating the, the yeah. examples you're pointing yeah. at now? So uh, I think there's a number of things, but please, I don't want to overclaim. I don't no. want to say we do it uniquely. That would be completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, but I do think there's a few, actually. I mm. uh, would say this very quickly because I don't think it's where we want to dwell, but there's yeah. clearly a role in the jobs and skills piece. Yeah. So strong communities are those that have economic success. We understand that. So we have got to think about what our economic future is. Mm. Of course, we're going through something of an inflection point as we come through technological change. We come through all sorts of change of attitudes on the back of the pandemic. Mm. And of course, dare I say it, on the back of Brexit as well. Mm. So we have got to be really clear as a region, where are the jobs of the future coming from? Because yeah. that will feed into the communities. And yeah. then how are we going to get people trained in those yeah. jobs? So yeah. there's a definite role there. But yeah. let's just think a little bit beyond that. Sure. I think one of the next things you can do, actually, as regional mayor, and this might seem a slightly tangential answer to your question, is speak up when you see things that aren't Good. going right yeah. in a community. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to choose an example that's not from Coventry, which is from Birmingham, actually, but I think is very, very important, mm. that when we saw the protests outside schools over equality teaching, yeah. and they were intimidation, frankly. Yeah. And it was because it was one particular faith group who was doing that, there were a lot of people in leadership positions who chose to turn a blind eye. Mm. I decided that was entirely wrong mm. and it was very important that you stand up and you be counted and you say this is not about tolerance between different faiths and it needs calling out. Mm. And sometimes in a leadership role like this you do have to step forward even though I know there were some people who disagreed with me very strongly about as they saw it taking on the community that were doing the protesting, but there was a principle of tolerance that it's was to be defended. It's a good example, and in some of our presentations, people have been worried about, within liberal democracy, how politicians tend to pull back because they're worried about ballot box consequences of stepping up. Ah, uh, but I believe in liberal democracy there is nothing more important than defending the principles on which liberal democracy is, uh, is based. Yeah. So you have to step forward. And we had another example. This was from Warsaw, again, not from Coventry, where we actually had uh, the Hindu Mandir there 
uh, attacked. We believe that it was a, uh, a faith-based attack. Mm -hmm. And again, you have to step forward with that community, with the mm -hmm. police, to ensure that something was done. And in mm -hmm. fact, the perpetrators of that were apprehended by mm -hmm. the police. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is something about a leadership role when mercifully, occasionally, things are not correct. You are there on the scene, present, actually stand up for something. So I mm -hmm. think that's very important. The other thing, though, far more positively, there's definitely a role which we've tried to put some structure around, actually, that we call our Faith Strategic Partnership. We probably don't get much for branding for that. No, no. Uh, where, we, where we've pulled together leaders of different faiths across uh, no. uh, the region into a group. And very importantly, we supply them information, we listen to their requirements, and actually they can then go and do a better job as faith leaders mm. if they're much more glued into the mm. civic structures as well. And I hope people would say that over the last few years, I've really tried to build that resilience amongst mm. faith leaders mm. by drawing them into that network and actually making sure they can do the job they want to do. Mm. And the best example of it all was, of course, in the pandemic, who did a lot of people look to when they were frightened? Yeah. They looked to their faith, faith, leaders. faith leaders. How did the faith leaders get the public health advice? Often we were supplying that. Mm. So in our discussions in the forum, we've heard a lot about existential threats and challenges and problems and things still to be done. So in your, this is your fifth year now as mayor. This is, it is. Um, what, what's still to be done? What's top of your priority list for creating the sort of thriving, peaceful, resilient, resilient place that you so passionately want? Um, uh, I think the answer to that is the whole question, well I know the answer actually, is the whole question of training and education. Yeah. The, the opposite of thriving communities is where people have no opportunity. It often comes from a lack of educational achievement. It often comes, and I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, from an ignorance, because mm -hmm. I am a huge believer that if you educate people, they will show tolerance, they will show inclusivity, mm -hmm. and it tends to be that understandable and regrettable human characteristic that if you don't have the luxury of education, you sort of recede into what sometimes can be your own prejudices. Mm. So I'm absolutely clear. It is that question of uh, better education and, of course, better skills to enable people to get those opportunities. Mm. So if you said to me, what's the single most important thing about social mobility? Mm. What's actually the thing that delivers levelling up, if we want to politicise yeah. it, to the yeah, government yeah. word? It is that question of people's skills and their educational mm. achievement. I'm going to come back to levelling up shortly, but I'm, yeah. I'm really interested also. You mentioned the voluntary sector and how important yeah. that was. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your feelings about the private sector? As, a, as an ally of yours, you know, as someone that can mobilise behind you and, and support the initiatives you're, well, you're so well describing. Yes. Um, so I think I've always been very clear on this, yeah. that uh, businesses, I've described it in my time in John Lewis, because I did lead an organisation for 10 years, mm -hmm. which I hope epitomised this, mm -hmm. was, or business is, a force for good. Now, some, lots of people say at the moment, is business changing? Is it suddenly waking up that it's got to become this? Yeah. And they often put that question around the climate change That's debate, right. actually. Yeah. And people say, are suddenly these businesses that have been polluting forever suddenly going to be enlightened? Um, now, we could come back to that maybe, but yeah. I think the general point is that business has for many, many years been a force for good. Mm. Think of the sort of social change, the innovations, the medical breakthroughs. The business with academia often has driven. Mm. So I'm very clear if business employs people, gives them good reward, uh, improves their social conditions, they are a huge force mm. for good. And what I often see from business now is that they want to step forward even more and do the right mm. thing. Mm. If you said to me, what could they do right now? It would be take on a Kickstarter, take on an apprentice. Mm. And I always say to small leaders <clears throat> of small businesses, the most important thing you can do for society is just give one more person a job because that will give them a completely new horizon. Mm. And you see this in the recovery from the pandemic and this need mm. to give these kickstarting opportunities. Mm. So I see that. And I also think if you just think about some of the finances yeah. that businesses have put on the table, take the city of culture and how funding for that came forward from the business mm. sector. It was one thing where 
where we were better than our competitors who were bidding for City of Culture. Mm. Brilliant reflection on Coventry and Warwickshire business. Mm. If I look at the Commonwealth Games next year, the way businesses across the West Midlands have stepped forward to sponsor that, so they want to be associated with these huge community activities. Mm. So, yeah, I'm a, I am one side of the debate. Overwhelmingly Absolutely. good news. So I'm sure you look back fondly on your experience at John Lewis's. And, oh, oh. And so I'm going to, it's oh. a bit of a naughty question in a sense. How are they coping with the revolution in, in transactions, with consumption online and so forth? And are there lessons that even as an observer you can now take forward into your regional well, governance? I don't role? think you should ever go back to the scene of the crime, Mike. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, uh, five year, over five years since I left yeah. John Lewis now. Yeah. So uh, frankly, I don't think I should offer any opinion on how they're now doing. But the obvious point is um, it's proving much more difficult. I was lucky to be leading at a time where... Um, we had a really good run and yeah. the thing I was most proud of in my time in John Lewis though in a sense wasn't the numbers we were voted the most trusted brand right. in Britain yeah. uh, just as I left actually yeah. not just in retail in any sector of the economy you will be interested just in this little diversion because I think it does actually talk to one of the themes you've had over the last few days yeah. for five years we were second in these votes and it used to frustrate me that we yeah. couldn't get to top and one organisation was top every year most trusted brand in Britain the BBC yeah. and then they fell off their perch and the reason they fell off their perch was the problem they had over gender pay differences pay and it gave us an opportunity and it said to me consumers people who judge companies really are interested in these social yeah. issues yeah. so it's critical that a business or any organization is in the right place on all these social issues but to your question i mean the thing about john lewis is yeah it's got a much bigger challenge now because trade has gone online and of course that's difficult for all retailers we know that but they like everyone else have got to find a model that does bricks and clicks hand in glove that's really the challenge they've got to find a profitable way of doing that but they have got one thing that will last well beyond you and I talking about online or offline. Yeah. They have got a model where the employees own the business. Sure. They've <clears> got, I used to call it, an alignment of values that the customers wanted to see honesty, value service, and our employees wanted to provide it. It was all aligned and the rewards mm. were aligned. And they've still got that trust. And so I still believe they will come through and be a victor. So trust is a really important it's outcome. It's the most important thing. Because yeah. it's very difficult to put a cash value on it. But if you've got that, it enables the brand to do all sorts yeah. of things. I remember when we started advertising. John yeah. became famous for advertising. But yeah. we never used to do any till my time. The first Christmas ad we did was 2009. Yeah. And I said to the marketing agency... I don't want you to advertise Christmas or product or anything. Your mission is to advertise trust because yeah. nobody else can match that. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe that a business that has that has got a remit to do anything. And in a sense, that's what businesses have to do for communities as well. And that's what you're clearly injecting through your strategy. But I was thinking also of the consequence of digital to you know, the paucity of activity on high streets and the mm. change in our urban structures that you'll be worried about as yes. well. And the way in which information is now spread online. Alongside the growth in online shopping, there's online social media and so forth. These are all challenges for you, I think. All yeah. challenges. I mean, there's all sorts of things in your question there because, mm. of course, the consumer is now all powerful because yeah. they have all information at their fingertips. The old-fashioned version of John Lewis was the sales assistant was all powerful because he knew all the product specifications, what you wanted, what you do now. You go on Trustpilot and you get all that. So the model of power has changed. But let's go a little beyond John Lewis. The consumer is also all powerful now in being able to see what their politicians are up to. There is nowhere to hide anything. News is immediate. And of course, yes, the consumer has changed their habits and it's brought us all sorts of social issues in our cities not necessarily all bad. Mm. If you think of some of the little local high streets and parades in this city, they're actually bouncing back because the shop local idea is really very powerful and it's been great. One of the effects of the pandemic has been to see that come back and that's good for communities. Mm. But obviously what's really tough is 
undifferentiated city centres sure. and let's call them out of town retail parks, yeah. that's hard, yeah. it's going to be changed but isn't it exciting in Coventry that the proposed redevelopment of the city centre, I say it's probably going to be nation leading in terms of what's happening there mm. because it's actually thinking about what's the social purpose of a new city centre and the fact that the anchor institution of that new city centre south development is going to be a performance space yes. that takes Absolutely. us almost back to a medieval idea in the positive sense of that yeah. a medieval bringing together of people in the city centre the meeting place yeah. it's very sociable so ironically the whole advent of digital has changed the property market in that way mm. and the answer in Coventry is going to be about a meeting place mm. I think there's a lovely symmetry to it that's brilliant you mentioned levelling up earlier yes and um this is hugely important. At a time of, of, of growing inequality, it's important for everyone. I don't, I don't share uh, others' views that it's a party political issue at all, and I know you don't present it and come at it in that direction. But what can you do as mayor to, to support a movement that can improve the lot of people in relation to other people? Levelling up is about creating more balance, more equality. Yeah. So it's about equality, it ultimately, yeah. levelling up. Um, you can get very dry and give an economic and a numbers yeah. analysis yeah. of it. You know, can we close the average productivity gap with the southeast? Yeah. You know, there are some hard nosed num ways of yeah. describing it. But ultimately, it's about opportunity and equality. And why is it? And I hope I don't get booed in Coventry for saying this. <laughs> why is it that a youngster in Wolverhampton has significantly less opportunities than a youngster in the southeast? Because yeah. actually. I will just say this, yeah. Coventry's performance in terms of social mobility is actually very positive mm. compared to other areas of the West Midlands. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is also a levelling up within the West Midlands Good. between some areas of the Black Country mm. and East Birmingham and some of the more positive areas, which includes a lot of Coventry and most of Solihull. Mm. So there's that dynamic. But then there's also a levelling up within a city as well. Mm. We know that in this city there's huge differences between different uh, communities. Mm. So all those elements of levelling up happen. So, I mean, there's lots of ingredients. There's investment answers to it, of course. Ultimately, the private sector will drive levelling up far more than the government yeah. will do, actually. Mm. And one of the great successes of Coventry recently has been to attract inward investment, mm. new high-quality jobs of the future. Mm. But I do come back to one of the things that institutionalises is it between generations is the lack of educational and yeah. skills performance yeah. and there we definitely have an active role to make sure that opportunities are being put forward for youngsters in the more challenged mm. communities and it's a small example but one of the things I'm really proud of is some of the work the combined authorities done with some of the communities in Coventry that are the toughest Will and Hall would end where we've actually made mm. sure that some of our employment training programs are concentrated in those mm. areas. So that's um it's exciting times, I think, when you take, take, take the view that you have control within this area to make a small change that can be replicated. I'm interested also, uh, some discussion during our forums, we've been talking about how issues should be more important than party politics, and yes, how correct. we can cluster and coordinate efforts and energies around correct. issues. And it was particularly referenced in terms of young people's participation in politics much more likely to be angry about climate change or poverty or ro bicycles or whatever. And is there space in your mayoralty for cross-party or cross-party issue-based uh, initiatives, do you think? Yes, there's a yeah. categoric answer to that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, before I sort of am too holier than now, let's yeah. be really clear, yeah. I, I'm a proud Conservative, I stood as a Conservative yeah. candidate, I'm never going to deny that, yeah. but I do not subscribe to the view that in this job my primary loyalty is just to the Conservative Party. I'm not whipped by central office or anything like that. I'm not like an MP who, in a sense, part of their deal is they have to follow the whip. It's, yeah. We all understand the rules. Yeah. But the whole idea of the mayoralties when they were created was that you're actually loyal to your citizens, not just to your party. Mm. And what I hope I have done on the rare occasions I don't agree with my government, is stood up against that, mm -hmm. actually. And that, to be fair, interestingly, has been respected by the Prime Minister because yeah. he understands the role of mayor, of course, having done Have the done? job himself. Right. And I hope what I've also done is managed to draw people together across mm. party. And on some of the very biggest issues, we have worked together across party. And you know, if we look at some of the investments that have come into this city... Mm. Um, I hope I have worked effectively 
with the city council that at the moment is led by the Labour Party. Mm. There are three Conservative councils in the West Midlands, four Labour councils, but I have got to work with all of them mm. because you are the mayor for the West Midlands, not just for the three Conservative councils, to put it extremely bluntly. Yeah. So it is a role that by its very definition forces you, encourages you, and it's what I wanted to do, so I'm not reluctant about mm. it, to work cross-party in that way. And one thing I'm really pleased about, if you look at all the key financial decisions of the combined authority, they have all been agreed cross-party. Cross -party, yeah. So when we said we're going to loan the money to Coventry for the regeneration of the city centre, when we talked about Frygate 2, the station, the contribution we made to the Gigafactory, all of those were decisions that were made cross-party. Yeah. So you'll get where I'm coming from. In, I'm not in sure, the actually. No, from the rising... But I'm interested in all those conditions, including collaboration, that will lead to more... likely lead to peaceful relations and to thriving communities. So we're interested in ah. mobilising whatever it takes. And collaboration came up strongly in, in the last couple of days, and you've just underlined that very strongly, which is... Well, I think it's interesting, because mm. if you... Go back to your very first question, and you say, what's one of the sort of characteristics of successful communities? We didn't talk about it, but we could have done. Yeah. Unity of purpose yeah. is perhaps yeah. one of the biggest ideas. Mm. And if you are constantly warring, and you know, you've got your battle lines set up, uh, then you are unlikely to have that unity of purpose. Mm. And this, and this might is, And sound... place helps, doesn't it? Place helps. Pardon? The importance of place. Uh, yeah, of course, unity, unity of purpose, of pride yeah. in the location, yeah. back yeah. to exactly some of those communities we've talked yeah. about, the institutions yeah. that bring that together. But sometimes there are political debates that actually drive people aside. Yeah. Now, I, I, probably if the camera's on me, people will see me slightly wince, because yeah. I, I think I am going to say what I was thinking. Yeah. It has not been helpful to unity that the whole debate around... Brexit was so divisive. Yeah. Whatever side you were on, mm. for years we defined ourselves as Brexiteers or Remainers. Yeah. Now that hardly draws people together and it went on for a very for too long, long time. Yes. And actually <clears throat> it's happened yeah. and people actually are letting that distinction fade a little into the background mm -hmm. and I genuinely think that will help mm. us create more unity of purpose actually and I'll give you another example and some in the, yeah, the cathedral may disagree with me over this yeah. the whole debate just having been in Scotland the whole debate about independence or unity there it's not helpful no. but it just goes on and on and on you yeah. need to draw because in the sense of place the United Kingdom will be taken as a place that needs to be drawn together yeah. as well so having these really long-standing divisive political issues are very difficult, they work against that. And it's the same in a smaller local community, obviously. Very, very helpful. So one of the big questions that we were posed to Justin Welby yesterday was whether he was optimistic or pessimistic looking forward. Because we're, oh, yeah. we're in difficult times. Yeah. We're in a time of, of, of great stress globally, as well as regionally, as well as within mm. the post-Brexit mm. uh, scenarios. Um, so where, where does uh, Andy Street sit? Oh, uh, Are you an optimist uh, or a pessimist? I about am by nature an optimist. Yeah. Um, I, and I will give you an answer which isn't just my sort of, what's the word, um, uh, unending optimism despite the evidence. So we'll come on to a bit of evidence in a minute. But I honestly believe you wouldn't end up doing this job if you weren't a reasonable optimist, actually, because yeah. you've got to have a belief yeah. uh, in human nature, ultimately, that things can be improved. But why am I so optimistic? It's one very simple answer to that, actually. Um, it's what you see in young people. Mm. And I'm sure 30 years ago, some old codger like me would have sat here and said the same to the idealists of the 1980s and 1990s when I was young. Mm. But you, if you just think about this climate change issue, mm. and you think how the world has changed its views on this mm. in the last, uh, well, unrecognisable mm. to, over the last decade yeah. and changed hugely just over the last five years. If I think of the, uh, my first election back in 2017 and the issues that people talked to me about, mm. climate change was hardly on the list, Interesting, but yeah. really, really clear uh, in all the hustings I did this year, that it, was, it always came up in one way or another. So it's fascinating how the agenda has changed, how young people have been a huge responsibility in changing that agenda. Mm and they want to contribute positively to the answers. Yeah. So I'm, uh, for that reason, I'm a huge optimist. So we're going to open it up now, if, uh, with your agreement, Andy, to, to some questions from the floor. Um, 
Richard, are you there with your mobile? Yes, I have a, my, my roving camera. I'm ready to run wherever anybody raises a hand. Uh, we do have one question online, uh, which I will come to in a moment. But first of all, Matty has a question. Good. Perhaps you could say who you are and uh, keep your question brief. And we'll take two or three. Um... Hi, I'm Matty Heaven. I'm one of the councillors in Coventry. Thank you very much, Andy, for being here to, this afternoon. Uh, obviously, the theme of this event for the last three days is about leadership and peace. What would you uh, say... Uh, four attributes of a leader should be and um, how would you inspire uh, if you wanted to give an example of someone how they should be leading for the future what would that be so if you want to take it let's, let's yeah we'll go straight to it otherwise i won't remember three questions yeah. when matty already <laughs> says she okay. wants four things um okay so permit me to say i think there's one thing above all else in leadership and the word I would use is authenticity. Mm. You know, people will talk about clarity of thought, ability to communicate, ability to get people to follow them. But I actually think the thing that underpins all of the leadership qualities is this notion about authenticity. Everyone can suss out whether someone is actually genuine or not, whether it's the real them that's been presented or whether it's a facade. And my experience in life has been that if you show your real values and people think your values are honourable, then they will follow. So it's that whole notion of genuineness, authenticity, having a value set that you don't compromise on is ultimately will, is what will get you through. And making the obvious point, uh, the current debates that we're seeing in the press over the last two weeks is where there's a sort of sense that some form of um, authenticity, deep value sets have been infringed, really. So I think that's the most cherished aspect of leadership, and it's also something that it's very important never to step over, really. Hmm. Thank you. Richard. Yes, another question. Thank you, Richard. Hello, um, my name is Neslihan and I am a committee member of Lord Mayor's Peace Committee. Hi. Hi and um, had the privilege of studying peace and reconciliation at the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. Uh, also, uh, someone who is already actively, you know, volunteering for all the peace events. Actually, this morning, I was at Earlsen Primary promoting their peace garden, uh, which I totally um, agree with what you said. Thank you very much for being in here and talking about this important subject of leadership in peace. Um, what I observe and studied in Coventry shows that we do have a great reputation in terms of uh, city of you know, peace and reconciliation, yep. and we have got amazing organizations that voluntarily works on this. And we have already started through Lord Mayor's Peace Committee, reaching out to schools and, you know, giving peace education. I, was ju I just want to come back to the f one of the first things that you mentioned. You said that the job opportunities are very em important and employment. Could you give us an idea, would you have a vision about how to turn all this heritage and knowledge into in, it turning into a, a, a employment and what can as a mayor how could you support this and uh, because I just would like to put these dots together it's, it's like is it possible to make money from building peace or promoting peace and what would you say about that thank um, you so I think your question can be taken in two ways um, can you make money from the heritage that this city has? No question about it. And we're sitting amongst lots of institutions that do exactly that in the, uh, in the tourism, in the education sector. So many of them are based on the history of this city. But let me take your question in a far more broad way, actually. I think that what underpins peace and reconciliation is the simple principle of mutual respect a mutual understanding because we know that it's when that is not there you get the opposite and this might seem a very strange link <clears throat> but I actually think that is exactly the same principle as underpins dynamic 
economies where innovation occurs, where mixing of ideas occurs, uh, and actually you get wonderful job opportunities out of that. So the principles define that society. But where, where do the best ideas come from? It is from those ideas, those places where there is tolerance, there's mixing, there's respect. So that's exactly how uh, the two link together, as well as the formal institutions that we see building on that. Do you think that's right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're nodding at me. That's good. That's encouraging. Ah. Yeah. I have one question here. Hi, my name's Janet. I work for the Birmingham Diocese Justice and Peace Commission. Lovely. Um, yesterday, Justin Walby was talking about the high numbers, I mean really high numbers, of um, climate refugees that is going to be over the next few years and how the imbalance and how, you know, this is going to affect the peace of the world. Mm. And at the moment... We've got the problems with the boat people coming across the channel and the way we, as a country, are treating them. How do you think we should be treating these people that are actually only trying to go for a better life? Yeah. Um, great, so, question. great question. So there's, there are also two answers to this. And um, uh, the first answer is, of course, to the immediate issue. And the answer is with huge respect and dignity. And one of the things that I am most proud of in the last summer is that a different group of refugees, but exactly the same point, uh, the Afghan refugees, that um, over 70% of them arriving in the UK arrived in Birmingham Airport and were given a welcome, largely by Solihull Council, and have been accommodated across the West Midlands. Mm -hmm. So we have stood forward and shown the very best of British hospitality and now the whole process of the resettlement programme is going through. But it is exactly in that spirit that we should show, uh, you ask how we should do it, what principles, that whole piece of respect. But there is a second answer to the question, which is that we have got to do a better job as a world uh, in terms of making it less necessary for people to flee the countries that they are fleeing, whether it's for economic reasons, for climate reasons, or for political reasons. And that does take you back to the conversations of the last two weeks in Glasgow. Mm. Because if we do not answer those climate questions, we will see more countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, become uninhabitable for climate reasons, and therefore we will see more people displaced. So we have a responsibility and I'll put my card on the table here, as I think the British government has really stood up to in the last two weeks, to say to the world, we've got to come together to stop the things that are causing that long-term displacement. And that, in another sense, is what we can do about the very issue that you raise. Mm. Mike, if I may ask uh, a question, uh, since we're coming to the end of uh, our event here. Um, Andy, you rightly spoke about levelling up and uh, the need to address the health and wealth uh, inequalities that still exist in our communities. I wonder what your thoughts are on about levelling up the democratic participation rates. Mm. Uh, the number of people over the age of 60 uh, proportionately as a percentage who vote in elections, whether local or national, uh, is way greater than those under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I wonder, um, A, whether that concerns you, and B, what ideas you might have to address that issue? Yeah, um, of course it concerns me because um, democracy um, exists on the principle of everyone participating, basically. Mm. And if people feel remote from that, uh, then obviously it weakens that, weakens that. I guess, again, being very, uh, very straight with you, uh, it would concern me more if I thought this was a very new phenomenon or what we've actually seen in every generation since the war is that people's participation rates when they're younger are less than when they're a little bit more mature. And I may be wrong on the maths, but I don't think there's anything that says that it's particularly eroding 
but what this is actually seeing is each generation in their youth are less active and become more so. But nevertheless, we should be doing more because, as I say, it's the principle of a democracy. Uh, and uh, so what I've tried to do in this role is set up things like the Young Combined Authority, for example, to bring young people into our decision making, let them all through their networks, big social media networks, make sure they understand what's going on. We've actually spent a lot of money promoting the elections across the West Midlands, try to make people involved. And also what I've tried to do is make people understand that the issues that end up either in the mayor's in-tray or a councillor's in-tray are directly relevant to the lives of young people. And if we take climate change again, blindingly obvious that some of the decisions we make on transport, on housing, they directly affect those outcomes. And I think that's the way of getting people recommitted to our democracy. Andy, you've been hugely supportive of the work that we've done and of the city of Coventry in pushing the notion of peace and reconciliation. But, um, and I'm very grateful to you for the time and your accessibility. That's a huge um, asset for us. So thank it's you very much. It's part of the job. So I'm going to finish my last question really to ask you what's, what's most fun about what you do? We have many challenges, we have many frustrations, but what's really fun about being mayor of the West Midlands? Um, or is it all doom and gloom? No, it's not all doom and gloom. I wouldn't have stood for the job again if it was all doom and gloom. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess, I guess the most fun bit is this, um, that doing this job, I don't want this to sound wrong, but you can sort of do whatever you want. Now, what do I mean by that? Mm. If you want to meet a manufacturer in Tipton, you just pick up the phone. If you want to meet a head teacher in Coventry, if you want to meet even a sport, not, not quite the centre forward for Aston Villa, but you know, the, the whole point is this, this role gives you an incredibly privileged access. Mm. Now you have to think about how you use it, it can't be flippant as I've made the answer to the question slightly, uh, but you can actually bring people together, you can convene things simply through the office and that's nothing to do with the formal powers that the devolution deal said the mayor had. It's just about the privilege of the role really mm. and often it leads you to meet genuinely inspiring people in whatever they're doing in life but it, it is a genuine privilege to have that ability to access to convene and can i thank you very much for returning that accessibility we we have access to you everybody tells me how accessible you are and that's a really important thank quality you. in leadership and thank you for this conversation thank you very much my pleasure thank you. Thank you. we've got a little something for you oh Oh, you know, you shouldn't of do rising. this. I'm not, I'm, in one of the things about this role, I'm not allowed presents and gifts, you know. People say you, you shouldn't. So if you, tell me it's, if you tell me it's just symbolic, then I will it's be very It's very symbolic of rising. It. it will sit on your desk, we hope, so that you will think about peace and reconciliation in, in your everyday life. Thank you very much. Thank That's you really very kind much. Of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I should just pick up. Yeah, sure. So, um... That's fine. I'm just going to close uh, our forum. The, all it leaves for me to do, uh, and to all the many online, your patience and your support has been superb. We've been watching how many are out there. And this last session, I think, reminded me powerfully of, of why it's important for us to meet when we can. You know, someone once quite recently said to me, wouldn't it be nice if we all were back to normal? And how many times have we heard that because of the pandemic? And my response was very, very clear. I said, I don't think that the normal we had in January 2020 was where I want to go back. I want to go back to a better place, to a world in which there is less trauma than we've heard. Some of the presentations have been quite gripping, haven't they, and quite upsetting. So let's think forward and some of the inspiration from our presenters, including from our mayor, um, have been uplifting. And let's plan for a world in which we have peaceful relations by default, not as a result of peace building, replacing conflict with, with order and stability. Let's look forward to a world in which we create the conditions for peace and then we can enjoy them. And those, those conditions we've heard a lot about during the last three days. We've heard about uh, the importance of prosperity, of equality, of rights, 
of respect, of dignity. These things are really important. They are not just words. And anything we can do through inspirational conversations, um, through debate, through disagreement, to provoke more understanding of the importance of those issues then we should take. And that's our mission within Rising. I'm very grateful to John Whitcomb for the cathedral, to Martin Reeves and his whole team at the City Council. This partnership started in 2015, inspired by big global figures like Desmond Tutu, and we've continued, in spite of difficulties and challenges, last year completely online, this year we decided to mix and have a hybrid affair. I'm really pleased we did, and it's been great to have the opportunity to engage with people around the presentations. The theme this, this, this year was very important to me, that we are all leaders. We've defined leadership as the process by which we mobilize change. Leadership is about making sense of the mess we're in, and helping those who want to take us out. And we've had some really inspiring help with our thinking on that. And it's the leadership within you that we're hoping that Rising 2021 has mobilized. So thank you all for your participation. A particular thank you to Richard Dixon, who manages this and who makes all this possible, and to the team of people that volunteer to create uh, the space that we find so safe and so uh, accessible for us to have our debates. And uh, we'll see you all next year. Thank you very much. Uh, the date's in the diary already. It's on the back of your program. And next year, we're looking at digital peace. We're, looking at, we're, we're going to look at the consequences of the change in the way we communicate to each other and the pluses and minuses of a world of connectivity. So I look forward to seeing you then.